to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the psalmist said i will not give sleep to my eyes nor slumber to my eyelids until i find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. Psalm 132, verses 4 through 5. Have you ever had insomnia? Maybe a night where you just laid in bed and could not go to sleep no matter what. Did you know that in the Bible there is one type of insomnia that is actually good for you? Stay tuned and we'll find out exactly what that is. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. When the psalmist said, I will not give sleep to my eyes nor slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for God, he emphasized that putting God even before sleep was something that was needed in one's life. You know, when you think about insomnia, all of us have had times in our life where we laid in bed desiring, longing, begging to go to sleep even, and you couldn't, and how miserable that is. Maybe you've tried it all, counting sheep, whatever it may be, and nothing worked. In Scripture, David or the psalmist actually says, I'm going to have an insomnia. I'm not going to go to sleep until I find a place for the Lord. You know, what's interesting is sometimes in the Bible there were people who were asleep physically and they were also asleep spiritually. They hadn't found a place for God in their life yet. Think about Saul in 1 Samuel 27 verse 6. He was asleep both physically and spiritually. He wasn't where he needed to be running from God. Then you think about Jonah. Jonah chapter 1 verse 5, in the midst of that great storm, Jonah is asleep physically and spiritually. And then think about the disciples. In Matthew chapter 26, as Jesus is in the garden praying, the disciples are, are sleeping and Jesus said, Could you not watch with me one hour? Asleeping, not ready physically or spiritually at that moment. And friend, as we think about those examples, and as we think about the need to find a place for God, first place for God in our life, even before sleep, let's ask ourselves some questions today. Are we sometimes sleeping spiritually? Have we really found a place for God in our life? Well, that question begs another question. What place... Will God accept in my life and yours? Will God accept any place in my life? Will He accept last place? Does He want to be in the middle? What place does God ask for 
in my life and yours. A friend, as David said, I will not rest till I find a dwelling place for God, for the Lord. We know what that place is. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things be added unto you. What place does God want and ask for in my life and yours? First place. Philippians 1 verse 21, Paul said, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And you think about the words of Jesus as He emphasized what Christianity is all about. If any man desires to come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What place does God deserve in my life and yours? First place. When David said, I'll not give sleep to my eyes nor slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord. Friend, that emphasizes we've got to make sure that God has first place in our life. You know, when we think about David finding a place for the Lord, David or the writer there of the Psalms is talking about building a house for God and a, a place of worship and putting God above all else. But where is it today that God dwells? We're not talking about building a temple not talking about the tabernacle. We're not talking about some building somewhere. Where does God dwell at today? The Bible says in Acts chapter 7, verses 48 through 50, that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house shall you build for me, says the Lord? Has not my hand made all these things? And so we're not talking about building a physical place for God. We're talking about letting God dwell in our lives. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 27. And think about the words of 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are His. And so as we think about finding that place for God, that, that good case of spiritual insomnia, let's realize we've got to make sure that in our life God comes first, that He's living in us through our life and through our actions, and that even before a good night's rest, God must come first. Well, how then do we find a place for God? You know, when we think about this question, naturally, we want to ask, Will we find a place for God in our life? David sought diligently to find that place of worship and that place of habitation for God. And will we have that same mindset? Remember, it's Christ in us that is the hope of glory. Colossians 1 verse 27. He is the one who has preeminence in all things. Colossians 1 verses 15 through 18. And we need to let Him have first place in our life. How then? Does a person find that place for God in his life? Well, it begins naturally with obedience to the gospel. How do you give God first place in your life? Initially, by obedience to God's commands, by doing what He says. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Friend, maybe you've said to yourself, I want to give God first place in my life. I want to find a place for God in my life. And, and you realize that place God desires is first place. How do you let God into your life? By obeying the gospel of Christ. Friend, how does one do that? Throughout the Bible, we're clearly taught what the plan of salvation initially is to let God into one's life. Have you heard the message about Jesus as the Son of God? Jesus Himself said in John 8, verse 24, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Do you really believe Christ is God's Son? That He's the Savior of the world? That He is the way, the truth, and the life? And that nobody comes to the Father except through Him? John 14, verse 6. If you believe that, would you get the other things out of your life that are keeping God from coming first? Would you repent? Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verse number 3, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Are we willing to turn from sin and turn to God? Acts chapter 3, verse number 19. Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? 
the Ethiopian eunuch did. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8, verse 37 through 39. And it was Jesus who said, in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, You won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father. And having confessed the beautiful name of Jesus, to get God in the right place in our life, are we willing to be baptized for the remission of our sins? Think for just a moment with me about a, a man who had to get some things out of his way to really get God first. That man's name was Saul of Tarsus. He'd been doing a lot of things he thought were right that were contrary to the will of God. Holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, dragging men and women who were of the faith uh, into prison in Acts chapter 8, wreaking havoc on the Lord's church, and yet with letters given to him, authority given to him by the high priest, he is now headed to Damascus to do the same thing. And Jesus confronts Saul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And Paul says, Saul says, Lord, what would you have me to do? You go in the city and be told you what you must do. What was that must that was essential for Saul? In Acts chapter 22, as Saul recounts his own conversion, in verse number 16, God sent a man to Saul by the name of Ananias. And Ananias came to Saul and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Sins are washed away. All the evil and ungodliness is removed by the blood of Jesus and God's given first place in our life as we obey the gospel, which includes being immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. But it doesn't stop there. How else do we find a place for God in our life initially by obedience to the gospel? But friend, we also let God have first place in our life by living for Him each and every day. That's what God wants. God wants me and He wants you and He wants every one of His children to give Him first place by living for Him. That's how simple Christianity is. Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. To really let God have first place means I want to live for Him 100% every day. Romans 12 verse 1, Paul said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. Be faithful until death. Revelation 2 verse 10, and put God first above all else. Now, there is another area that we want to mention as well. Not only to give God first place do I have to initially obey the gospel, not only to give God first place do I have to live for Him every day, but we also want you to consider this. If you're a child of God and you know God doesn't have first place in your life, and you realize you're in sin, friend, the Bible teaches to give God back that first place. You must confess and repent of that sin. Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 13 clearly says, if we're willing to confess, God Himself will forgive our sins. The Bible says in Psalm 66, verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. So maybe at one point in your life, God did have first place, and that place has been overtaken by something else. Friend, you've got to be willing to confess those wrongs and to repent of them and give God the first place that He deserves in our life. Now, let's ask another question as it is related to a good case of having that good case of spiritual insomnia, seeking above all else, even sleep, to let God have first place. Let's ask the question, does God in my life and yours have first place as it comes to worship? You know, a lot of people in this life 
worship a lot of things. They put them first. They give them priority. They let them have preeminence over all else. Let's realize that God, above all else, deserves our worship, our adoration, and our praise. Do you remember the words of 1 Samuel chapter 15? About verses 21 and 22, Saul came to, or Samuel came to King Saul, who had just sinned against God by trying to put himself in the place of the priest. And he said, Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Friend, if I'm going to serve God and worshiping Him, it's better to obey than to just simply do what I want to do. Worshiping God, just going out and worshiping God however you want to. That's not what God wants. God wants us to obey Him and worship Him acceptably. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. How do we do that? By worshiping in spirit and in truth. And when we have our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength engaged in worship, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, and if we're worshiping according to the principles of God in this book. And so does God have first place in our worship by worshiping the way God wants us to worship, not men. Jesus said, as He thought about the devil's temptation in Matthew chapter 4, He said in verses 9 and 10, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Are we worshiping God only, putting Him first? Is worship really a, a priority to us? Do, do we get there on time? Are, are, are we getting everything we ought to out of worship by putting in our best? Do we make sure that we don't let anything get in the way of us forsaking the assembly of the saints? Hebrews 10, verse number 25. Do we have the mindset of David? When David said in Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said, Let us go into the house of the Lord. And so God needs first place in my worship. But you know, God also needs first place in our finances. Now friend, I hope you'll listen real carefully. We're not talking about begging you for money today. We're talking about you giving to worship in your part of worshiping God on the local congregational level. That's the sense in which the Bible does speak about giving as it relates to the Christian on the first day of the week. Does God find first place in our finances as we worship Him. Now realize, I'm only a steward and you're only a steward. As stewards, we've been entrusted with what God has given us. 1 Corinthians 4 verses 1 through 4. If you think about yourself as a steward, just a manager, just an overseer, just one in, in charge of, it really doesn't belong to me. I've got what I've got and I'm helping oversee that for the good of God. That's the mentality we have. Yet too many times, we think of our finances, we think of our stuff as mine. None of it's really mine, and none of it's really yours. We're simply stewards of God's. As a steward, I've got to be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. I'll be judged as to how I give stewardship over what God has given me. And Jesus clearly taught us the right mindset for giving. Give. It'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Well, men put back into your bosom. God expects me to give cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. And you know, when you think about putting God, letting Him have first place in our finances, we see a great example of that in Luke chapter 21. Do you remember the poor widow? Here's the scene in the setting. Jesus is sitting opposite of the treasury and He's watching all the people put in money as they come and the rich who had much put in with great pomp and, and esteem and everybody saw how much they put in and it made a, a loud noise and, and they wanted to see what everybody saw, how everybody felt when they put that large amount in. And then this poor widow comes by. Clank, clank, just two, two mites. There's two little sounds in that coffer. And Jesus said, she gave more than all. What do you mean she gave more than all? She just gave two mites when they put in a bunch. They gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her poverty. They gave out of their overflow. She gave where it hurt. That woman was honored and will be honored for now to eternity for her putting God first in her finances. Will a man rob God? 
Malachi said, and yet many have robbed God today by not giving Him first place in their finances. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 6, God said of the Israelites that their failure to put God first was like putting money in a bag with a hole in it. it just didn't work out well for them. What they put in wasn't coming back because they weren't putting God first and they weren't giving God their best. And so we want to ask ourselves, where is God in our budget? Are we giving to the local congregation? Are we letting God have priority in our life as we give to the local congregation on the first day of the week? According to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we're to give every first day of the week, just as Christians in the first century did. And we want to give liberally, cheerfully, and give back to the greatest cause in the world, the cause of Almighty God and serving Him. Then let's ask another question about putting God first in our lives. Will God find first place in our speech? Will our speech be what God really wants it to be? Ephesians 4 verse 15 tells us how to speak. I am to speak the truth. There's the content in love. There's the nature. Does God have first place in my speech? Am I following in the footsteps of Jesus as I speak? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. You know, our speech is to be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that we may know how to answer every person. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 6. And, you know, when we think about letting God have first place in our speech, not only does it mean I've got to speak in a way that isn't contrary to the will of God? Not only would it include saying vulgar things and using foul language and things related to that, but if I'm going to have, let God have first place in my speech, do I realize I've got to speak about God? Letting God have first place with my speech and with my tongue means that I'm going to let things about God naturally flow out of my mouth. The Lord does not need any silent partners. He's got way too many already. The Lord needs people who will stand up and speak out and put Him first in their speech. Remember Matthew 9? Jesus looked out on the uh, fields, on the people, and the, He said unto His disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of hosts, He'll send out laborers into His vineyard. What was He talking about? Uh, fields and wheat? Not really. Jesus was talking about souls who are ready to obey God and hear the message. And friend, isn't that our commission and our mission? Mark chapter 16, verse number 15, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. We're to go to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things commanded us. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And so, if we're going to put God first, I've got to be willing to stand up, speak out, and to say something about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to proclaim the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. But you know, when we think about really letting God have first place in our life, Let's make it even maybe a little more practical. Are we letting God have first place in our homes? Isaiah chapter 39 verse 44. The question was asked, what did they find in your house? God asked of Hezekiah, what will we find in your house? What did they find in the house of God? What, what was missing there? Were there things that weren't in order? And friend, what will God find in our house? In our homes. You know, the home is a place that is designed to glorify God. Genesis 2.24, the Bible teaches, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, that the two shall become one flesh. And that home, that family, that unique unit is designed to help one another bring honor and glory to God in this life. What about in the home, the relationship between husband and wife? Are we glorifying God? In that relationship? Are we treating our spouses like we ought to treat them? Ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 through 31. Are we really being honorable and loving toward them? Are we being respectful toward one another? 1 Peter 3 verses 1 through 7. Are we really having the type of marriage that God wants us to have? Husbands, are you being leaders in the home like God wants you to be? 
Wives, are you being the keeper of the home and queen of the home as God has designed? And, and, and children, are you obeying your parents in the Lord for this is right? Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. But you know, as we think about these ideas, there's a whole host of different ways we could think about is God finding first place in our life? But the most important is, is God finding first place in our life as it relates to salvation? Have I really taken the initiative? Have I really taken time to make sure that I look at things in the proper scope, that is through the lens of eternity? Do I realize that life is so brief? What is your life? It's but a vapor here for a little while, then it vanishes away. James 4 verse 14, and, and am I viewing this life as my one opportunity to get right with God? Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, we're, we're begging you, we're urging you today, don't go to bed tonight until you get your life right with God. Now friend, that naturally is going to include considering and thinking about the consequences of sin. Sin separates a man from God. Our sin separates us from a holy and loving God, and the soul who sins, he'll surely die in that sin, Ezekiel 18, 4. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23. If one doesn't obey the gospel, lives in sin, dies in sin, the Bible teaches he'll be separated from God forever. If that's one state, sleep is not the top priority. Getting right with God ought to be the top priority. But the good news and the remedy for that situation is found in Jesus. When Jesus came into the world, it was said, You shall call His name Jesus. He will save His people from their sins. Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21. And so we encourage you today, if you've not found first place in your life for God, won't you do that? If that means you need to obey the gospel, then friend, clear the other things out of the way and simply obey God's plan of salvation. Hear the Word of God. Believe in Christ as God's Son. Repent of those things, those wrongs in your life that you know are not right and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 22, 16. And if as a child of God, you know there are things that you need to clear out, clear those out. Whatever the case, do what David did. Don't give sleep to your eyes until you find a place for the Lord in your life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.